I call this retreat of the Williamsburg James City County uh, School Board to order. Uh, Ms. Sosa, will you please call the board? Mm -hmm. Ms. Hummel? Mr. Kelly? Here. Ms. Umby? Here. Mrs. Taylor? Here. Mrs. Young? Here. Dr. Beers? Ms. Cook? Here. Thank you. I'd like to let everyone know that Ms. Hummel recently called and she is on her way. I expect her momentarily. Um, may I have a motion to approve the budget retreat agenda, please? Madam Chair, I'm going to have you approve the agenda. Sorry. Go ahead. Any second that in discussion? All right. So is there any call of vote, please? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Omidy? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Agenda is approved. Before we uh, get into the budget discussion and hear from Dr. Heron and staff um, about what we can look forward to in this year's budget discussion, we have a few disclosures. Mr. Kelly. As a member of the, of the school board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge I have interest in the fiscal year 2018 2019 school budget because my wife is an employee of WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and with public interest. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And I would like to add that as a member of the School Board for Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018-2019 school budget because I, I am an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe that I'm able to participate in, in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public, public's interest. All right. Um, thank you. Dr. Heron, before I turn it over to you, I'd just like to let everybody know, thank everybody for their uh, hard work in rescheduling this event. We originally were supposed to have this on Saturday, and now we're um, just before uh, a regularly scheduled meeting. So um, with that in mind, I'll hand it over to you, and hopefully we can... Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this evening we're going to present some of our needs for the upcoming year. Um, we're looking forward to having some uh, guidance from the board as to your preferences for some of the items that we present this evening. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Ms. Barnes, our Chief Financial Officer, who will be taking the lead this evening. Ms. Barnes. Thank you. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, other board members, and Dr. Heron. Um, during this evening's retreat, I, with the support of my colleagues, uh, will be presenting and discussing information on the fiscal year 2019 budget as it pertains to our division. So here's an overview of this evening's discussion so I'm prepared to cover with you. First, I'll remind you of the state's requirements for developing the budget, and we'll provide a brief overview of this year's budget process. Then I'll share with you some of the data that we have regarding our historical funding. I have some information to share, for you, to share with you regarding our local composite indices and how they've changed for the new biennium, which of course has a direct impact on our funding from the governor's proposed budget that was published on December 18. Following the info on the LCI is information from Governor McCall's proposed budget. This information will provide you with a base which we can begin to set budgetary uh, priorities. We do have some salary adjustment recommendations and scenarios that we will discuss that align with the report from Evergreen. We also will review the projected increase in the cost for our current health care plan. After this, we'll go through our departmental staffing requests as well as the individual department requests that are not related to personnel. As you've gone through this process before, this is just a reminder that State Code Section 22.1-92 requires that the superintendent for the approval of the school board must provide an estimate of the amount of money that is considered to be needed to support the public schools in the division, and that the budget must be set up for each major classification or category that has been prescribed by the Board of Education. This also reminds us that as a very good process, we will join the cost and the government have the needs to support the schools and the district school division. The state code section 15.2-2503 requires that on or before April 1st each year, we must approve a budget of needs to pass on to our government bodies, both Williamsburg and James City County. So between now and April 1st, we must determine where our needs are and the level of funding that is necessary to support those needs. While developing the budget, we use the current strategic plan principles and priorities to guide the development of the budget to ensure that the goals align with the plan and that it supports the needs and goals of the schools and taking into consideration the input of our stakeholders. So our process. In October, we began collecting input from each of the school's principals and each department's administrators. At that time, they entered 
they entered their requests into our financial system. Once I joined the division in mid-November, HR and Finance, as well as the assistant superintendents, met with each cost center manager individually to discuss the requests and determine their needs. And in December, we began discussing and evaluating the cost center requests with the superintendent senior leadership team to ensure that what we present to you is indicative of necessity. This leads us to this evening. We're presenting the items that were determined to be necessary to the division so that we make out of your opinion as to how those leads to be prioritized in the final budget. As we look back over the past 10 years, as you can see, now on September 30th, 2008, the division's enrollment was 10,248 students and has grown by 1,229 students as of September 30th, 2017. We're expecting to continue to grow by an additional 15 students, and this is based on the future think low projection. The most likely projection shows the division growing by 129 students. The low projection has been within 1% for the last six years, and we use that number because we don't want to overestimate enrollment since much of our state funding is contingent upon the number of students enrolled. And if it's overestimated, the risk of budgetary shortfall is increased. And I do need to mention that these numbers um, don't include preschool. So this slide simply shows our enroll enrollment by level. And it's, um, it's fluctuated very slightly, but it's shown a steady growth over the last decade. In 2008, the elementary schools had 4,568 4, students and grown by 450 students as of 2017 and are expected to lose 11 students in 2018 based on the, the future think flood projection. In 2008, the high schools had 3,397 students and have grown by 422 students in 2017 and were expected to gain 32 students in 2018. In 2008, the middle schools had 2,286 students, and they've grown by 357 students, and we're expected to lose six students next year. Um, just as a reminder, the 2,000 numbers are derived from future bank literature. Looking at the history of our state funding, we're looking back to 2009 as we have in previous years, because that was the year that the recession made its initial impact. And until fiscal year 18, our funding was at a level that was less than that of 2009. Now, the aggregate provides the appearance that the funding level has been restored, but by breaking it out by rough, the rough average per pupil, we're receiving $314 less per pupil than we were in 2009. So the revenue has declined, and we're also faced with increased mandates. But Williamsburg James City County has been fortunate to receive additional students. Otherwise, we'd be looking at less debt building. In fact, um, I pulled the DOE's calculation tool that incorporates the governor's budget, that proposed budget, rather than looking at the rough estimate of $314 per pupil. And if our enrollment was 10249 as it was in 2009, our state revenue in fiscal 19 would be $29,818,266, which is almost $3 million less than it was in 2009. This leads us to the discussion of the governor's budget that was released on December 18, 2017. The new composite indices for Williamsburg and James City County were made available in November, and these indices are for the next biennium covering fiscal year 2019 and 20, and will go into effect in July of 2018. Uh, Williamsburg has dropped slightly by 0 0.0044, while that for James City County rose by 0 0.0016. Just to note, 0.8 is the maximum LCI. The composite index is the state's measurement of each locality's ability to pay for public education. So the formula takes into consideration the changes in property values and taxes, the local income and retail sales, and it compares this to that for the entire state. And much of our funding is derived by the per pupil cost multiplied by one minus the composite index. So theoretically speaking, the lower the composite index. Um, it should lead to additional funding. While a higher composite index would result in less state funding. And as the LCI increases, the state funding goes down with the expectation that the locality will be able to contribute more. And the LCI is supposed to be an indicator of wealth of the locality. If it goes up, the locality is going to have increased wealth. And this is just our historical review of our composite index from 2001 through 2020. And Williamsburg has dropped from a consistent 0.8 for 16 years and has gradually dropped to 0.77 over 30. While James County has been a little more volatile and has fluctuated from 0.6 to 
for a court in 2001, dropping to 0.5286 in 2009 at the beginning of the session, but is somewhat stable around 0.56, um, with the next being by the end of the meeting at 56.57. So moving forward, with the governor's budget, the General Assembly went into session last Wednesday, January the 10th. Just to note, this will be the first year of the new biennium, and the session will be a long session, with the last day of the regular session ending um, March the 10th. The members of the General Assembly will determine what portions of Governor McCollum's budget they wish to keep, modify, or eliminate. And after the recess on March 10th, they may reconvene again on April the 18th. So as we look at this, the other divisions for which I've, I've had the fortune to work um, have actually designated sales tax as a state funding, where we here in Williamsburg, James City County, we're unique in that we consider sales tax as part of our local funding, so we don't count it as being state revenue. According to the governor's budget, though, the portion derived from the state's collective sales tax has gone from 12 million 875,248 to 13 million dollars with an expected increase of $212,783. The next is the state revenue. The SFQ funding is expected to increase by $897,306, while the categorical and civic revenue is expected to decrease by $44,241. But this shouldn't alarm us because this often shifts between the two pots just depending on what the legislators want to <coughs> present. Um, but the most important thing to note is that we should receive an additional, based on the governor's budget, um, we should receive an additional $1,065,848, which represents an increase of 2.2%. Well, this brings us to the non-negotiable increases. <clears throat> As there is some discussion on health care, a later point, um, I didn't include this in our health care cost increases as a non-negotiable increase. But have included the contractual increase for our obligations to New Horizons, our general liability insurance, and the cost of staffing and operations at James Blair Middle School. I've also included the offsetting decrease for the contribution rate with BRS, the Virginia Retirement System. Um, these were adopted by the BRS Board of Trustees, and the BRS Board has certified the rates. So we're looking at a reduction uh, with the rates for fiscal 19 and 20. So we'll see a savings, or we should see a savings of $496,456. So this leaves us with a net increase in expenditures of $1,100,370. And on the previous slide, we saw that the makeup for the state revenue, but we're experiencing a loss in some of our other revenue. Um, we're expecting a slight increase in our impact aid revenue, about 10,000. And then the trend for our building rent commercial revenue is declining from about 25,000. Plus, our custodial staff will no longer be cleaning Thomas Nelson Community College, so that means that while we won't need new staff, custodial staff at the middle school, we're also not receiving revenue from Thomas Nelson, and that's about hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars So we looked at the five-year budget projection, that was actually the proposed budget um, that's online for James City County. Now, they've approved this year 17 and 18 on that budget. But they also include 19 through 21 in those budgets. So it's noted that this could change, depends on their, their taxing and uh, should their revenue projections fall short. So that being said, upon looking at the published public budget and including the proportion of from the city, we're looking at a proposed increase of $5,613,703. So that leaves us, when we take, take away the non negotiables, it leaves us with a net of $4,615,000. $680 with which to begin our discussions. As we move forward, our enrollment drives our funding, as well as the need for additional resources when enrollment continues to grow. So we have three options to use for determining our enrollment numbers. We have the number that the governor's staff has allocated in generating the budget. Um, which is always much higher than our reality and uh, so the actual enrollment. So we have two projections in the future think the outside consulting group, group which has been contracted. We have future think low projection, which has been within one percent some inch before for the last six years. And we have the future think most likely projection, which is slightly more aggressive. So when budgeting we use the conservative number because as a division we don't want to overstate the expected revenue and then be caught in shortfall 
which also would be greater and compounded because we've increased that re required resources and additional staff to accommodate a larger enrollment number. Also listed is our division's approved core staffing allocation. So, although we're projecting the low projection, a gain of only 15 students, the way that the enrollment's falling on our staffing ratios, we actually need one additional teacher in the elementary school level, six additional teachers at the high school level, but can move four teachers from the middle school level. Therefore, we've determined that three new teachers are needed to be our, our core staffing needs. So looking at the future thing most likely in the governor's projection, we need one teacher in the elementary school, seven in the high school, and only one can be moved from the middle school. So therefore, we're asking for four teachers that could be as reserve of contingency. So this slide just shows a combination of the net beginning uh, of the four million six hundred fifteen thousand six eighty, and it subtracts the cost of the three teaching positions that will be needed for the low enrollment projection, plus the four teaching positions that um, would be needed as a reserve or contingency. So the 4,615,680 minus 525,000 for the teaching positions leaves us with 4,090,680 to consider other initiatives. And this leads us to the additional needs of our special education programs. These are moments of the world. Um, an area that is growing here in population is our English learner population. Looking at school year 9-10, the EL population was 199 students. And this is growing to 711 students, and it's growing by 83 in our current school year. So this equates to 512 students over the last nine years. And, um, Mr. Paula, we'll discuss this area and the divisions we need to do. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Perry. As you can see, the JCC's English learner population has grown significantly over the past eight years. Well, while the number of students enrolled in our school has increased, the predominant enrollment by language has stayed consistent with Spanish, Mandarin, and Arabic top numbers. The Virginia Standards of Quality requires a minimum staffing ratio of one ESL teacher for every 59 English learners. Please keep in mind that this is the minimum requirement and does not take into account the varying needs of students with lower language proficiency, interrupted education, and adjustment into our community. We have seen an increase in the number of L's with lower English language proficiency levels, also known as DLP. As you can see here, 63% of our all WJCC L's are level three or below. 38% of our L's are level two or below. 85% of our K2 EL population are at proficiency level three or below. This is a significant number because we know from numerous studies have stated that students who cannot read on grade level by three, grade three, are less likely to graduate in the time. Mr. Paul, can you just educate us in the public on level three, two, and so everybody just knows what that is? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so each language level talks about how much they can survive in English. So the very first is entering, then emerging. Those are students that have very little resources with reading, writing, speaking, and listening. The level one students virtually have no English skills. They require a lot of attention um, and direct instruction. Level two have slightly more and can communicate slightly in reading and writing, um, but their output is significantly less. When we get to level three and four, the output and the ability to communicate writing and orally increases. Um, students are more independent but they're still not at the level where they're fluently speaking in English. Um, they receive less services than um, monitored students, which are level five and above. That helps. So level five and above is switching. Yes, we call them now monitored students. When there's three years that students are monitored, they're no longer receiving direct uh, services from us. Okay. But we touch base with them, make sure that their grades are on, on target. How many levels are there? Uh, we have level one to four and then three years of monitoring. Thank you. Eighty-eight percent of our sorry, one, one less old data point on the answer. eighty-eight percent of our high school L's are percentile. <coughs> also significant because this affects the amount of students that can graduate on time. So how many students would that be? I 
So our numbers of students that are level, let's see, level one high schoolers is 144, and level two high schoolers is 126, and level three in high school is 177. So 144 high school students don't speak English. Very, very clear English. significant portion of the English language populations in high school. We have a significant portion in high school, and that's why later that we also have a significant portion of the English school. Ms. Paula, do our English language learners have the ability to stay with school longer? Yes, they do. They can stay with school longer. Just generally speaking, I'm not going to be able to do Many times they are used to American schools, so they can probably in other countries with other countries. They don't have American English. Correct. They've had interested education. They may have left school in their home country at, for example, fifth grade, but they are watch us in seventh and they've had interested education. Okay. The students that are in the media level, the
state requires standard and quality minimum of one to one. Uh, one region to one. Which are, which are? We are currently 12 years old, which is exactly fitting to one if we employed the um, Jodea model and we graded our students, we have one at 1,014, we could be 17. Um, ESL teachers are That's a significant The other question, I will call it. Any other questions on APLs or the numbers? Obviously, when you look at it by school, you can see that you have a need in some schools and others, not just in the basic number of students, but in the level of need with regard to, to it as well. Just to make sure I understand, so if we use the, the DAO model, we would, we would have 17 additional total. We have five additional plus five additional. So we currently have 12 ESL teachers with the one to 59 unrated. If we waited, we have Total of 17. Glad I asked. Yes. <laughs> We're not out of Another area we experience growth in is our special education student population. Over the last nine years, the population has grown by 190 students. And the other aspect to remember is that special education students have their own IEP, and the expense may vary from year to year uh, based on the mixed students' needs and required services. Well, we've seen growth in higher need disabilities as well. And I really would require to provide the services and indicate what the students are to do. And Ms. Kibwal is going to well, you speak on this and, and our needs for the division. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Chairman. Um, and one of the things I'd like to point out on um, this chart that Ms. Morris has put to you, that you do see a line here trend here where we had some ups and downs. Um, but the significant thing is that the past three years it has been a steady increase for a total of 192 additional students in the past three years. Um, so we, we anticipate that that upward trend will continue. The next slide provides a graphic representation of the percentage of students served in the disability categories established by the state. And it's um, important to note that just as core teachers must be certified to teach their specific subject areas, special education teachers must have the appropriate certification in order to teach specific disability areas. So for instance, if we have students that are hearing impaired, we must have a teacher that's certified in that area in order to provide those service units. One measure that we use to anticipate the number of um, teacher positions we'll needed is to meet the certified meet the services determined in our students' IEPs is the number of students found to be eligible. As you can see, the number of students found eligible has been more than 110 average the past two years. Uh, with 24 students found eligible so far this year, that trend is anticipated to continue. Is 24 increase? Last year was slightly more. It was, uh, I can say, over So it's like at this point last year. Well, it was at the end of June, we provided that number a month later. So, so, so it's pretty in line. It was 3940 and then it got to 150. <laughs> Typically, the um, spring months tend to be busier as we go through our process and we work with children and families in child study and we put interventions in place and we should probably respond to those to see if those are making a difference. So typically, we will have to see a much higher number of referrals starting in the March April time period. So does the increase in the special ed um, population kind of follow the general percentage increase in just the general population? So, or, or you know, like you see the ESL <coughs> and you're assuming it's because people from other countries are moving in who don't speak, you know, so it's, it's an influx of people that are ESL students, but uh, are you seeing in, are you seeing a percentage that kind of match, matches the general population? Because it should, I mean, it should kind of remain the same, right? What and that's percentage? actually not a number I've looked at. I'm just curious. I'm just curious to see if it's like an anomaly, and there are actually people coming into our district because of the services we provide. No, I, I would anticipate it would be higher, but I didn't know why it was higher. So okay. we have to do that. 
An earlier slide showed the increase in this. I'm sorry. Go I'm sorry, Dr. Spears, I didn't see you. Just a quick question. Um, <coughs> what's the ratio here between staff and it's, it's done on a point system, and, and we actually have a future slide we'll that will kind of go into a little more detail on that so to help explain it. So, um, an earlier slide did show the increase in the number of special education students served in WJCC. This particular slide shows the related increase in special education staffing. Over the past five years, our teaching staff has grown by 13 and a half positions, while we've also added six paraprofessional positions. And Dr. Beers, I think this will speak to what your question is. Special education is required, has required additional FTEs the past three years. The increase in the number of students served is a primary data point for consideration, but another data point is the actual caseload of our special education teachers, which is established through the SOQs. Caseload limits are determined using a point system established by the state. A student who received direct services for less than 50% of the day counts as one point, while students receiving direct services for more than 50% of the day counts as two points. Depending on the type of caseload assignment, special education teachers in WJCC can carry between 16 and 20 points. When a caseload gets to 19 to 20 points, it's considered a max for the SOQ. This graphic shows the number of teacher caseloads that we have by level that are currently at or above maximum. So for instance, if you look at the elementary uh, graphic, there are 43 teachers who carry caseloads. 10 of those are either at 19 or above. So they're at or above maximum. Uh, and you see the, so we have the potential of being over in all three of our levels. Has Jamesy County historically um, funded our special education population with the point system, or do we use a different model? Yeah, that's what we're required to do. Okay. But are you asking for the funding yes. of that? Um, <coughs> I can only speak to my time here. I do know that, um, and if you look back at the chart that shows um, FTEs, we did lose F teachers. Um, in 13, 14 school year, we lost a few positions. Um, at that point in time, we were well ahead of the SOQ department. And when those positions were reassigned, um, there was still, you would not have seen a graph where you had that many classes at. There was nothing close to that. So we, didn't have, we did not pare it down to that level. So it's then the, 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 the increase has Push us up to the next level. There's an increase in number of students, but also an increase in the level of community that we're impacting the points and then After looking at the information that relates to our enrollment for special ed students as well as our English learners, if we deduct the expense of the four special ed teachers, two special ed teachers aides, as well as the three ESL teachers, the cost for that would equate to about $575,000. Um, deducting that from the previous balance of $4,090,680, we would still have $3,550,680 um, in GUs for our additional initiatives. And, uh, Next, we're going to have a presentation from Evergreen, the company with whom we contracted to conduct a compensation study for the division. And um, Dr. Linda Basio is here with the presentation. Good afternoon, members of the board, Madam Chairman, Dr. Heron, on behalf of Evergreen, um, President of Evergreen, it's a delight to be here uh, to discuss with you our compensation review that we've had the pleasure of working uh, with your staff or that we've had several months on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I know your time is limited this afternoon, so I'm going to be very brief. Our process included our initiation and data collection element, our analysis of your current conditions, a market salary survey, as well as uh, recommendations. 
With regard to uh, the assessment of current conditions, first of all, as you probably know, you have three salary schedules. We did not look at the teacher salary schedule. The study uh, focused on administrative and educational support. Your range spread generally set between 50 to 70 percent at each category, each grade, is consistent across all salary schedules with a range of 60 percent. The division's current range spread is certainly in line with recommended best practice. Your midpoint pr projection, that is to, midpoint refers to, uh, to go from one midpoint to the next, of uh, one grade to the midpoint in the second grade, is consistent with an average midpoint progression of 7.6 percent for both of these salary schedules. In other words, the division's pay ranges have normal progression, which is, again, uh, important to recognize as we conducted this study. But the meat and the potatoes, of course, was your, our market survey, which I'm going to talk to you next about. When we went to market, we looked at 65 benchmark positions, 65 benchmark positions between the education support salary schedule and the administrative salary schedule. Okay? We went to market for 21 peers, and including your division, we had 22 peer unique organizations that we looked to. The next slide will give you names of peers. When we went to market on those peers, we had 520 market matches made among the 65 positions. Uh, i just like to say you guys uh, owe a debt to the 21 organizations, organizations that participated because they were asked for this between Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is a very crazy time of year to try to get all this data. So we, we applaud their efforts. Um, overall division salary ranges. What do we find overall? This is in a nutshell. 2.4 percent below the market average minimum. That means your positions as summary are 2.4 percent below the range for the 21 other organizations at minimum. At midpoint, at the midpoint within a range, you're 3.6 percent below the market midpoint average. And at maximum, you're 4.3 percent below market average at maximum. Okay, so in each case, you're below market for those two salary schedules. Where do we go out to? Uh, again, forgetting your own 21 other school districts, as well as others that you, other organizations where you compete for employees, especially in your education support services. You compete for custodians, you compete for secretaries, et cetera, from the city of Williamsburg, from Colonial Williamsburg, from James City County government. Okay, we looked at York County government, and most of the others are school systems within uh, your regional area. Okay, well, we had great participation. We've got a lot of readings on what bus drivers, what custodians, what principals, what assistant principals get paid in other jurisdictions. Obviously, uh, folks that don't have principals and don't have assistant superintendents to respond to the survey, but they did respond for the position that they have affected. Recommendations. The recommendations were made to your staff were designed to bring you to market and ensure external equity for all classifications in the two salary schedules. We implement education costs were calculated for fiscal impact, and when we provide cost impact to your staff for various pay options, which will be addressed by the division in subsequent slides. That's it very briefly. Any questions for me before we talk about numbers and money? We're actually looking at several options for salary increases. As you've seen, our salaries fall below the starting uh, average. So we've considered the above salary increase scenarios for all employees to improve and maintain the validity of our salary scales and avoid compression. Um, the above illustrates the cost for an average 3% raise. The first provides for the regrading, and the cost would be $3,087,166. And all of the figures in each of these slides actually do include the expense for FICA and the Virginia retirement system. The second provides for an average 3% salary increase without the rebrading at a cost of $2,347,166. Could you explain the 
Yeah. Well, we, so there are certain positions that are significantly below in terms of the market that we recommended re-rating those positions. For example, your bus drivers. I think oh, Okay. Okay. So some will be seven percent to get them exactly. Some are at market, so we're not recommending. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> there were three hundred forty-five employees that were out of line, and eighty percent of them were bus drivers, cafeteria workers. Who cafeteria workers are not included in this because they're in a separate fund, but um, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and consultants. Eighty percent of them. But if cafeteria workers would. That they're just in a different fund, right. so they would also waste the benefit of the 19,000. So the uh, average 3% increase for all other staff, um, all other staff being all other staff, right? Yes, sir. So, so um, that would be teacher's assistants, that would be bus mechanics, yes, sir. all other staff. All other staff. Uh, yes, sir. Um, substitute teachers. No, there's not a, we don't they currently have one in the place for this. We've got another slide, slide for the substitute bus driver section. I think the general thought is that the big big percent would begin to address a lot of the issues of being behind market volume in our salaries. Recognizing, of course, that other systems will be an increase this year as well. Much. So at best, we just don't fall <coughs> behind. Correct. Um, last year, we gave a 1.5 percent increase. Everyone else around us gave at least two. Um, I kind of also gave uh, two percent or three percent. Can you give it three percent? Three percent. I would expect a report would be available in the month. Yeah. Just 
And so what we kind of, like, after we were looking at, you know, we had three million, something mm -hmm. or other, where, what was the last 3.5? That's what the police
salaries. <laughs> Just for the uh, listening public, it seems that the, um, all of the board would like a relay, um, and uh, three members of the board would like a three percent increase, and four members of the board would like a two and a half percent increase. And I was like, uh, those of us who two and a half is not fifty dollars. We would prefer three, but I would go other. But fifty, I'm fine. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's not. I would love to get it. But that also assumes that we're, that, that that number is guidance. Mm -hmm. Where the first or second slide is about a budget of need. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to say a lot of work with the jobs here. With everything we we bring forward tonight, not everything makes it mm -hmm. that money. And so there will be a total tonight that will far exceed what's or certainly exceed the sum of that was being proposed in the company uh, market that's been published. Okay, move it on. Thank you. Okay. This, this brings us to um, options relating to our health care. The total increase for health care coverage, um, we're expecting an, a 7% increase. And uh, the total cost is equals $1,394,862. However, if we subtract the spousal surcharge savings of three hundred eighty-two thousand two hundred, the net increase is one million twelve thousand six sixty-two. So, it's been the um, it's been the history of this board to cover the seven percent increase of the employer, and so that actually comes down to the fact of one million seventy-seven eight sixty-three less the spousal support. That brings you down to the net employer increase of being $695,662. Um, the employee increase, the 7% for that, is, is $316,999. So the two combined is the one that is So I'll give you a moment to consider health care and give us some sense of whether you want to Move forward with sharing the seven percent increase between employer and employee. Um, whether you want the division to try to cover everything, or if you want us to look at other potential options for cost sharing. Just to be clear, we absorb the entirety of the of the um, increase of a million dollars. Right. If we split it, it's roughly It's less. It's over uh -huh. it's six ninety five six. So, what you're showing here is two thirds, one third. Um, working in the product itself costs about 18 and about the cost of the 
1,800 a month, uh, and the employee we're paying 78 percent of the plan. But the York County schools for their health insurance and down, actually they're paying uh, $2,173 a month. So for a similar product, we actually have a comparable product that has a better rate, uh, and we're sharing about 78 percent. Do we, do we know, um, say for example, your county church, the employer is funding? So is their split about the same? Correct. Their they're, they're splits are about the same, but their product costs more, more. more, and so they're paying more. Their employee is paying for health insurance more. and dental combined. They're paying $1,682 a month, and our employees are paying $1,400. I'm uh, sorry, the employer uh, is paying $1,062 a month, uh, and we're paying uh, $1,000. And so do we know if, if um, counties surrounding us are having similar increases coming? I think they're actually, well, I'm hearing more. Uh, you know, last year we had zero increase, year before we had 1.4% increase. Uh, and then Leslie, Monique, and I were talking, uh, we're hearing there are actually greater increases now. So do we know how they're planning to vote that? Are they going to split it with their employees? I don't know. So, the, so this 7% is, like, is a real number that you've had conversations with our provider about? Correct. It's just not an estimate. Correct. That's what I was to say. Yeah. It's pretty nice and close. Could you send us the chart that includes employee only and employee plus kids, employee plus spouse, and then family with what it costs and what we pay and what they pay? Because I think if memory serves, two years ago, we decided to move away from talking about in terms of percentage, but in, in actual dollar amounts, and what we are what we are contributing uh, in terms of dollars for each of those levels for each of the three plans. And so I'd like to see that, um, and then maybe rather than, although it's helpful to know about cost sharing with the employee, we can then look at what we contribute and then decide how much of any to increase that. That makes any sense. I think what you're saying like right now, our 250 plan is, is the most expensive plan, and then there's more expensive, reasonable plan cost wise. We, we, the school division, pay the same regardless of it. Hypothetically, if the employee wants to pay a higher, a higher right. plan, they're paying a the difference. Right. So, like for us, the two, for the employee, the uh, 250 uh, plans, it costs the school division $610 a month. For the 500 plan, it also costs the school division six hundred ten dollars a month. Right. The additional money is on the employee. They made that choice. Right. Yeah, because yeah. so the percentage then changes mm -hmm. right. for all for all sixteen right. iterations of twelve right. iterations. So it's just yeah. Could you, think, could you also include the number of employees in each plan? Sure. Just pick a day, January first or whatever. Just how many employees are on each plan? So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you know? Okay. We'll spreadsheet that. It is. I'll find it. But Ms. Smith sent it to me. Yeah, we can use it. Thanks. Is there a recommendation? So so when we look at benefits, it's always been the case. It seems that WJCC has really great benefits. But then our our um, salaries might not be as high. So, where do you, you know, do you have good benefits, but you, you do the 2.5 and then keep really good benefits and cover the cost? Or would the teachers themselves, the staff themselves, prefer? I'd rather have them more money and decide what I want to do with my, whether I have a high deductible or not. And, and, and you know, is that something that the but staff themselves would like the control, like they have more money, and then they can control what they want to do with it. I think it's very difficult to know. I'm, I'm guessing Mr. Baker would probably be more knowledgeable on this than I would, that um, probably younger staff would want more money in their pocket because they're less likely to face family um, over health issues, I think, as, as um, our staff may change it is, it's probably more comfortable and of health. Um, 
but we have enough options on health insurance to take the time to make the decision as far as which plans that we choose. What I just want to make sure, what I want to understand is if I give a two and a half percent rate, how much of that is going to an increase in health insurance and will they actually see an increase in take home pay? So, and we can, we can do some scenarios for the, for the board. Again, and, and which health option we Right, a lot of that, you know, but Mrs. Cook asked for in population based those will help us to help guide us to that. Any other information that you want to publish? Just just on the health My going in is that everybody increases the same amount. So that that's my personal so that so that if, if, the, if it's going to go up 100%, we pay 80% versus 10%, it goes up in the same way you can scenario. You know what I'm saying? Is that a bit clear? So, okay, so if, if um, right now on our lowest plan, we have 88% and 12%. So the employee pays 88%. Oh, I see. Yeah, the employee pays 12%, we pay 88%. So if the, if the plan is going up, Seven percent, or seven, I don't know, ten bucks. Mm -hmm. We take eight point eight of that, and they take one point two of that. So what we did two years ago was shift to a fixed amount that then the employee could buy up. So the percentage shifts depending on what plan the employee buys. So, so the percentage then would have to be, let's say, I'm making that numbers. We say we're going to need to five hundred dollars a month, and if we decide to make that six hundred, then that's what's equal for everybody. Or the bottom is up seven percent. Right. Because if the bottom is up, it will go up. Yeah. So we'll start in some scenarios um, provide to the board so you have a sense of where we can make up with that one. But thank you for your information. One more. In the previous slides, you know, we, we discussed and included the cost for the special ed teachers. And if we're meeting the new requirements, the special ed positions are basically non-negotiable. Um, we've also included, we are requesting an additional FTE for behavior and intervention specialists. And uh, will we switch a lot more to address this? Um, regarding the behavior intervention specialists, this is a requested new position. Um, it is one of the recommendations that came from the Special Education Advisory Committee in their end of year report to the board on the end of last school year. This position would support our classrooms that have a high number of behavioral concerns, um, and that does include all the key classrooms, all our autism classrooms. Additionally, it would provide training for staff on things like what are appropriate intervention strategies, how to develop a, an appropriate behavior intervention plan and then implement that plan and what's the progress monitoring look like to do with that. Um, it would also provide consultative services, um, support to schools where individual students may need additional support or interventions. Finally, we adopt strategically as well. We have a focus this year on FPSS, um, disproportionality and discipline. And this would be a resource that would be dedicated and special to special education to identify some of the potential potentially what have teachers with their classroom for their, their, their challenges. And so it was a strategic request as well. Okay, would this position just apply to special ed teachers, but teachers of a special ed population or could they help the regular ed teacher? They certainly could be. be Able to provide some a resource. Um, I think I think the challenge would become the workload uh, with, with 1,700 special ed students. Obviously, addressing those needs would be the most popular. Do you have any other major intervention specialists in the school system at this point? So that would be the university. We know um, it, it's a fairly normal position in, in other systems and larger systems in particular where they can go to the need of where the issue is and actually have the teachers create an environment for the students to learn. It's a resource that really is there for teachers and students that are needs. So the 350 is baked into our non-negotiables? No, that's one of the, as you recall earlier, 
I'm saying that it would be non-negotiable, but it's not included as one of those. Um, earlier in the other slides, we listed the, the four special ed teachers and two special ed teacher assistants. So I need the four teachers to be we are based on the reports we've shown you in the previous years, if you look at the number of teachers we've added, and that's just under the cap of the max SOQs, that's what we're anticipating. Right. So those numbers, you know, are still very low. We've got them right until I present right. the budget. They could go up or down, but that's what it looks like right now. Um, if the number of teachers and the assistants change, you know, the intervention specialist would be a, a very valuable resource. So, so. Do you see this, this um, intervention specialist as like an itinerant that goes around as a, like, as needed, but, you know, putting out the fires wherever they are across the school system? Correct. We um, prioritize that based on, on data points we have, and we know the event areas that you so that they absolutely. First of all, it's my understanding that um, each of these special ed teachers are specialists, both in and of themselves, either generalist or um, uh, one or two specific categories. The behavior intervention specialist um, is, is, is that somebody who um, is hope, you know, knowledgeable about all of the categories, or they lean more towards the ED category. How many kids, that's a bunch of questions, <laughs> how many kids are we talking about? Because I know the other big area that uh, I, that's right, I know other board members are concerned, is the growing number of discipline issues um, presented by students who are not in a special ed category. And I'm, I'm really concerned that um, there's, there really needs to be a need for um, a behavior interventionist um, to deal with those, because I don't have the numbers. I don't, you know, I, I just don't know, you know, are there, are there six kids in this school, are there two and a half, where, you know, where are the issues coming up? And I want to get the most bang for the buck. So yeah, I, I, I like to, uh, you know, I like to know in terms of numbers how many students are talking about. And, and I know we can't project, but at least um, in the past, like last year, how many? If you had a behavior intervention specialist, how many students would have been? And I don't want it to say all students. I mean, specifically, there are there are students that um, exhibit behavior that um, obviously interfere with the classroom, with the students, um, the teacher. Um, is there a small number? Is it a large number? Or is this person going to be a generalist and help all teachers or? So we can get yeah, those numbers for the board in terms of um, certainly the special education classes as long as it doesn't make the students like that reliable in, in those numbers. So we wouldn't do it by school or by program, but we can certainly give you a sense of the number of significant situations that this person could have yeah, had that's right. this year, and that will give the board some good information when they're considering this. And of course, I'd also, you know, I know it's the number of incidents by the other students who aren't in any one of those categories that we hear about all the time. What's been, you know, what, are we, what are we doing? What are we anticipating? Do we suppose in the future? Um, but we're kind of so what I start to pick up the pace just a little bit so we get through uh, all of the, the things we want you to consider this evening. This is another strategic request uh, to add three additional FTs, college and career coaches, one for each high school. Um, Dr. Carroll presented a couple of weeks ago on the profile of a graduate and all of the 
expectations that come along with our new graduation requirements for students. These positions would not be your regular school counselors and would not have that kind of role. They would actually be um, developing business partnerships, creating internships, um, creating job shadowing opportunities, mock interviews, all of the things that we need to start to orchestrate to get our, our students ready for, for college and career. Um, so this is a, a, a huge uh, piece of the puzzle for us to move the needle and actually um, make some of the things happen that are required. I think we want to to make our students ready for the world of work. I think one in high school. I was just going to say, with the needs, um, with the special ed needs, um, as Paula was about to describe the needs that we have for the ESL teachers. Um, so the three ESL teachers would would play to 225,000. Um, we're also looking at a, a, an additional half of an FTE um, to try to coordinate a social studies coordinator position who would like to make full time. Prior to going on, I just wanted to correct the data point that I spoke of earlier. And this is just a testament as to why people up to 55 need to use a bigger font. Um, when I gave you the numbers of level one, two, and three students, I gave you total numbers, but I think they were specifically asking about high school. Mm -hmm. So I can give you the correct numbers. Um, level one students at high school are 39 students. Level two at high school are 39. And level three at high school are 39. I think it was Mr. Kelly. Wear your reading glasses or bigger <laughs> Okay, currently social studies is only one of two content areas and the only core area that does not have a full-time coordinator. The point five coordinator position is responsible for K-12 social studies curriculum, instruction, and professional development. Additionally, the social studies coordinator is tasked with working with teachers to use the assessment literacy process to create common assessments for all grade levels, as well as create performance-based assessments for grades in which the state requires local or two alternative assessments to SOLs. WJCC's movement towards a balanced uh, assessment approach in which students are assessed in multiple ways, including paper pencil and performance-based assessments, adds additional hours to work with the social studies coordinator. We currently have at both elementary and secondary levels multiple partnerships with Colonial Cancer, James Town, Northtown Foundation, Florida City and Arkham Revolution, and these all provide on-site experiences for our students and project-based learning opportunities. In order to expand this, we would need additional hours for a social studies coordinator. Social studies coordinator also oversees the National Board Certified Teacher Program, giving direct assistance to teachers who are attempting to gain this prestigious certification as well as arranging for local and national funding. And as we, um, as our focus increases on project-based learning, the social studies coordinator will need additional time to facilitate, facilitate writing of PBLs that align with curriculum and provide cross-curricular connections with other core content areas. So in light of the fact that over time, the duties of the coordinator have expanded, there are additional responsibilities due to BDOE mandates, and the number of schools in WJCC has increased. I believe that there's a significant need for a point um, right now, is this person doing part part time this and then part time doing something else, or just part time? Just part -time. So she is she part time. It's just a part time. Right. Okay. And you said there's there's more than one coordinator that's half time, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and the those are going to stay half time. Well, there's only one other coordinator that's half time, and that is helping. Probably needs to be full time as well. So, uh, with recommendation to increase um, our ESL teachers to three, that gets us to 15, 15 instead of the 17. <coughs> and we do not use the point system. Well, we would still be using the point system, it's just that increasing the total number in one year would be significant, and then obviously for broader, broader to have them all. It would be closer. Um, I don't know exactly what the ratio would be. Seven one was modified to two. Are we required to meet that ratio? We're not required, but that's an industry standard. Okay. Yeah. Special ed teachers 
special ed is a requirement with health, it's not. So that's why, that's just this request for consideration and to see what we can do. Now we're looking at our transportation department. Um, Mr. Snipes actually pulled uh, a report of our average weekly hours for our bus drivers, and they're currently working 35 hours a week. So what we're suggesting is to change their contracts to 35 <coughs> hours per week. Um, this will benefit the drivers as well as the division. Um, they will, the drivers will be assured the additional five hours, which will also help with the division and the scheduling for extra learnings and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it eliminates, too, the time of waiting for that additional pay. Um, the only actual expense for the division, since they're already working these hours, is the um, additional cost for their VLS, you know, which is $13,750. Um, it can be, we can reconcile this on a monthly basis or a quarterly. Uh, if they didn't work enough hours in one month, they can work more hours the next. Worst case scenario, it can be adjusted if there's some of that they haven't worked the hours that they're supposed to work. Um, the only drawback, though, is that they will have to pay 5 to 5% 5 to the IRS. Um, this helps them in that we're contributing more to their retirement and they're contributing more to their retirement. So, should they retire, it, it will benefit, be a benefit to them as well. They might see a reduction in take home pay. But they won't. They wouldn't have to wait. Right now, they're having to wait to the next month when all the timesheets are coming in to receive their pay. Um, calculating it, would probably be about thirteen dollars a month. Any other set of consideration? It's something we would talk through with bus drivers and them. It's something we would make optional at first. Uh, and, um, for those who want to opt into it, because it does create some stability and when drivers are getting their pay and it helps with that with monthly lack of money that they weren't getting because of the month. I guess it helps with that issue a little bit. I still not going to get to it. There's no way to get under it. There's no way to do that. We don't have a staff, but this is a way to at least standardize that they're not getting on the end. So we pay we pay the for the first thirty hours. Correct. Right. Right. So this would be the additional the for the five hours. So, so, so we, if we regrade and give a raise, it might not feel that. Well, the additional five the additional five hours are getting more money for that. Right. It's just the minimum. Okay. Okay. And then we're also looking at increasing substitute driver pay by fifty cents an hour. So is that par, anywhere near par? With that is actually a good salary. Um, right now they're at 1226, so that puts them at 1276. And I believe, I'm sorry, they're 1236. You're at 1226. 1226, and that's comparable with the PMA. Again, pay 1326. We've got a moment to get up and die, and we'll have to make it fairly quick this time when the Super Council is going to do So, in your envelope, you have um, one section of that that says 137. There are seven options in this area, so if you could prioritize level seven and put the corresponding number. One, 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 Yeah. 
the special education market placement. These well and services that are currently needed for training the next year. 817. So you, if you want us to vote on those, even though they're non-negotiables, no. I don't think you're on your voting list, are they? No. Okay, we'll have Hopefully not, they'll vote on those. Okay. Okay, this is next one is um, really all to do with equity and high school programming. Um, with a number of students involved in there in college, we'd like to increase that to a maximum of 50 students with 50 at each school. And to do that, we're requesting $50,000 to do that. Uh, the CTE additional testing service, those are paid for certifications for students in CTE classes. That's also paid directly under the profile of the graduate and essential for those classes. The other piece to do with program equity, and fact, it's the this one. Um, it's is it after the next one? Okay. okay we'll, we'll okay. Okay, well, let's go with this one and then back again. Um, proposing to introduce Project Asia Red off the high schools. Um, this is minimal startup costs for course. Um, we would obviously offer and then only run those courses that make in the high schools. Virginia teacher for, for, for tomorrow, teacher for tomorrow is a program with minimal cost that any teacher can teach um, and is certified to teach to begin to grow our own teachers from students within our system. We would propose starting out at all three high schools potentially. Um, this does not include, include staffing costs because we think we can actually reuse staff and have them certified to teach these courses from our current staff. Right? This is just materials for startup. Going back, um, I may ask Mr. Ostop to speak to the concussion protocol you know, by in training place. Good evening, Madam Chair, Mr. Board, Superintendent. Um, <clears throat> we have been analyzing the concussion protocol from other school divisions around the Hampton Hills area, and we've noticed that we have some deficiencies in what we do currently and what other school divisions do. We can look specifically at Virginia Beach, which has a very extensive concussion protocol, and we have modeled um, what we see there in terms of estimated cost. Uh, that would catch us up to what Virginia Beach is currently doing. So what we currently do is we provide baseline testing for all freshmen and juniors that participate in high-risk sports at the high school level. Um, we do not provide baseline testing for any middle school students, and we do not provide any um, emergency medical care or athletic training services to middle school competitions. And so that $11,100 would essentially provide baseline testing for all middle school students, uh, all seventh grade middle school students, and eighth grade students that did not participate in seventh grade um, that are participating in high risk sports. For us, all of our middle school sports are considered high risk sports. Um, and then it would also include increased testing at the high school level. Um, they would essentially test all students that participate in what they consider high-risk sports, which is basically everything except for swimming and uh, track and field events that are, are running. Um, so field events would still be considered high-risk sports. And so every student that participated in any of those activities would be based on testing. Um, we used the stipend that we currently have for substitute athletic trainers at the high school level. We use that amount, which is $15 an hour, and we basically um, projected out how many home competitions each middle school we have, and that's how we came up with that. It's a minimum cost, and it's probably something that shouldn't be the same way. Um, if you feel the same way, you can take out the Yeah, you can make it work. Yeah, make it down the Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll just quickly mention the, the cross things we find a lot of interest in the cross. This is a minimal startup cost with recurring costs as well. Um, they have some 40800 there that's actually recurring. Uh, the startup costs would be 62800 That does not include travel, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, the travel would be significant because there are no teams in the area that are traveling and how to road to Richmond from across. But we did put a lot of research, we've done a lot of work on it. There's 
lot of interest in the community we thought we wanted to bring it to the board for their consideration. Thank you. How many students currently 
Uh, well, early on the line, um, in this current semester, we have 196 individual students that are taking a combined 249 courses. Uh, this also su uh, supports our blended instruction. Uh, blended instruction, we have 223 courses that are serving approximately 1,656 students. Finally, just a uh, review of this program evaluation services. Um, very quickly, talk with those. Okay, very quickly. Good afternoon. <laughs> Measuring the impact of our programs and what, what the impact is on students continues to be a real priority for us. Uh, this budget request would be for comp comprehensive program evaluation <coughs> services. And based on the request from the board and it funded, the very first program evaluation would be the James River primary year. Program, International Baccalaureate Program. Okay, um, we have one other slide that is not in the voting piece tonight, just for five minutes. Let's do, let's do the priorities first. <laughs> and we are running to the wire, uh, so I'm going to ask you to look very quickly on your priorities on this one. So now you have 11, so you only need 11 dots to teach a concussion off the table. Um, so just like before, if you would put 1 through 11 on these 11 priorities. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
That's your argument. I thought we already talked about that. And I thought the majority of the board supported trailers. I think, I think there's I think there's two two mitigating circumstances. One is that it was done without the context of opportunity costs, which is what this is about. And I also think it was done um, without um, you know, saying explicitly at that time that there is an external process through which this um, request has to go, and so it's not guaranteed that it will be approved uh, through the legislative body, through the, uh, through the land use decision at the planning commission and the board of supervisors. So at a minimum, I think it would be beneficial to at least understand that there might be a $62,000 savings if the trailers are not um, part of next year's operating budget, which is a separate conversation I would say. We're talking about a $135 million budget. We're going to have to kind of ask Ken, uh, I guess, why that's up there. Um, I'm assuming that they're meeting. Uh, yes, sir. As is everything else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is there anything else? Uh, well, no, I think they're, they're going to give me the overview of we were out all of this. It's obviously a lot of money and a bigger increase than so thank you for giving us your input and all of the pieces of the puzzle that the software is at the last is this the timeline uh, you know, it, it's our plan to present the superintendent's budget to you all on February 20th and, and it's, it's just going to walk you through that I believe there's a joint session scheduled for March the 16th and um, we'll hold a public hearing I think there's one this, well, there's one this evening and then we'll have a public hearing on the superintendent's budget on March the 6th, and we will hopefully present to you for your approval on March the 20th, and then we'll go to the new partners. We have a question. I have a quick, quick question. The $2.3 million gap we're collecting in the cleanup, that's best case scenario? Is that correct? That's if we, we took everything that's up there. But from the jet from the state, I mean. You know, because the, go the, that's the governor's budget. Right, so in, typically the governor's budget is best case. Is that, is that? It can be. It can be. Right? It, okay. You know, there are new, there are new members in the house. And it's in the legislature is solid. Right. I have not heard anything from the General Assembly yet. That's so what they're working into. They're thinking about cutting or adding. So, does anyone have anything for any comment? Um, if, if not, I do. Um, one of the things that I think came up in recent conversations at the board is the idea of, you know, we, um, every school at the high school and middle school level has a fixed administrator, a fixed administration number. So the per, per student cost of each school varies depending on the student body there, and, and if you vary every year. Um, and then there's formulas we heard a lot about today with uh, ELL students and special ed students. Um, but we do not fund uh, in any different or weighted or formulaic way for students who come from economically disadvantaged homes. And I think we need to consider doing that. I think we need to look at the data and what it tells us in terms of student achievement. And I think you know, as we look at trends and as we realize that the poverty rate has increased at twice the rate of our population growth, that we need to start thinking about that. So I don't know that this is the budget year, um, but I think um, a lot of the additions I saw at, at high school were equally applied, and which is fine. We need that. I have no problem with that. But I do think we need to start looking at um, ways to look at student need, given that we know that students' social and economic um, situations impact their learning at school, and even though that's not our responsibility, we certainly have to adjust to it in the eyes of the community. Can I comment on it? Um, is, is, is it school district responsibility to do that, or is it our uh, governing boards that um, they're responsible for all the citizens, uh, not just the students. And so I, um, I, I'm not quite sure I understand um, what the role of the school district is with regards to that. Pressing need, for sure. I know it's an issue. Well, 
what I think, and that falls under social services and also the, um, the government bodies. Much more than um, uh, our, our school system um, is in charge of being responsible for so many different mandates and issues and challenges. And I, I, I completely agree that, that there is a long, long, you know, a, a long term need for that. I, mean, is that, I really think that's a responsibility for the uh, school counselors and the Because we always hear, you know, we, we hear, well, we're not getting enough money, and it's because the state's not giving us enough money. You've made that comment many times. So years ago. And so I, I guess I would really come up with the same kind of comment is why if this is such a pressing need, why are all of the uh, uh, why is it for uh, the supervisors and city council stuff that I think it's comment I I concur with the chair's comments. I think that 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 this is a, the school provision's responsibility to, to, to fund our buildings based on student need, and we have very disparate needs. So we clearly have schools right now that currently have more children who are economically disadvantaged. We have higher numbers of children receiving free and reduced lunch. So it makes sense to me to provide more resources to those schools than the schools that have lower free and reduced lunch numbers. So that, that's what I heard, and I, I can cover all the chair. What did you say then? That's what you were maybe I didn't hear that. What did you say? What did you say? Well, yeah, I just talked about the um, the need to look at the socioeconomic makeup of where our students who have uh, who are more free and reduced lunch to use that as a proxy and provide the resources commensurate to that. Other than instructional and in support of things that you normally do in the classroom? Well that is beyond I think the the purview of this board yeah, to determine how to determine how, but I think it's a policy decision to say we would like to look at equitable distribution of resources um, through the through economic needs as well as we do the special ed and ELL. And although there's a, tr a tremendous overlap there, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so resource. Well, I just want to make sure I understand when you say resources. You're talking about the resources that um, the district has or can seek to uh, try to deal with that disparity um, uh, in a um, in an instructional manner. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I, I understand about the poverty, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not. Um, uh, I don't know um, if um, that's if, if we can parse out some of our budget to take care of non-instructional areas? Is that what you're asking for? No, no, no. no. Okay, well, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm confused. Yeah. Because you kept using the word, you used the word poverty, and you used the word um, socioeconomic. Um, and I fully agree that when there is disparity, we have to come up with the appropriate resources, instructional, school-based resources, mm -hmm. to help those students do that. We agree with you. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. I think you guys are just wasn't using language that properly, so I probably apologize for that. I mean, I, I, I don't basically disagree with the idea, and my only concern is I, mean, I think we should have a basis. I think we should have employers. I'm sure that that would be something that's possible. Because one of the things that the equity series has pointed out is that. You know, if we want to keep things equitable between the schools, and I think we need to take a look at what is equity between the schools and what are those recent resources that we're addressing. Sometimes I think equity and parity are at odds with one another. Yeah, I agree with that too. And I think with the last redistricting of high school, all of those issues that um, that came out, I think all of us were in agreement that there are certain schools that have more needs than other schools based on the population that are at those schools. And there seem to be, even from the, the parents 
of the schools that had low um, low needs that they were fine with that. They understood that. They were okay with um, with letting the school's administration figure out how to allocate resources appropriately to even the scale. Of the Am I wrong? Is that not what? I just I, I didn't yeah. want that budget retreat to go by without yeah. yeah. saying that. Any other comments? I mean, it's something that we certainly have started to talk about and what that would look like in terms where we would go with that and what was the desire of the board to go there. I want to hear any um, agreement or direction from the board or is it Conversation to continue it next year. Um, yeah, I mean, my request really is, and I think my colleagues agree with me, is to ask you to invest there. And I think it could happen over time. I think we really need to assess what already is being put into a school that has a higher associate status and number of students, along with some associate you know, status, need to look at what extra resources are there already. We brought programmatically to the school before we start looking at formulas by students. But that would be a secondary level of that discussion. And I just think also just to look at what the educational opportunities are for our students and making sure that those opportunities are the same regardless of what school they go to. That basically, regardless of what high school you go to, you go into that school with the same opportunity to to have different options at your disposal and not not feel like you don't or you can't do something because you're districted to one school or another school. Thank you. 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 Thank you.